This is uh, our talk about case conceptualization and treatment planning put into practice. So today we'll be talking about um, a specific case example um, in terms uh, and looking at that case in the constructs that we talked about in the previous two webinars about case conceptualization and treatment planning to give a specific example to talk about. Um, my name is Brianna O'Connor, and presenting today will also be Alam, and Dave is also here um, to answer any questions that come up. Please feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat box. Since there's a few of us posting, we have um, we can definitely be presenting and taking your questions and comments um, at the same time and contributing that way. So please don't hesitate to chat to us. Our company slides, obviously, this is a presentation put forth by MICTAC, the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center, which is made up of Mick Silver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research, as well as Casa Colombia, which is where our uh, main presenter, Alam, is coming from today. MICTAC also has several partners, um, including CCSI up on the left, which is where Dave and myself uh, join you, just so you know who's talking to you today. Today what we're going to do is, if any questions have come in or comments from the previous two webinars where we asked you to sort of uh, give us some time to, to find the answers to those, we'll be addressing those questions as they come up or as they're relevant to the discussion. Please don't hesitate, as I said, to also put any comments, questions into the chat box and we will answer them live during this session as well. We are hoping to review uh, components of effective case conceptualization very briefly for you. Um, that was a couple weeks ago, so we'll just do a quick summary of that um, with the goal of using that framework, the five piece framework that we talked about before, uh, to explore a specific case example. We will also review components of effective treatment planning and do the same thing, take that case and figure out what are some appropriate treatment goals for that case using the structure um, of effective treatment planning. And finally, we have some key points for communication with managed care organizations following from this specific case um, that, will, that can, are also applicable across cases that will help sort of um, put the case into the UM framework for us. So we did receive a few questions from the previous two webinars. Um, the first question is, uh, who's responsible for answering why previous service was not successful before the individual sought care at the current organization. So this is referring back to, in the case conceptualization webinar, I mentioned that an important piece from the managed care uh, perspective is why wasn't treatment successful before? Why is this level of care necessary? Why does the individual need this service? And although it's, it's true that the question could be answered in some of the referral documentation, what really we're looking for here, what I think the managed care organization is looking for is for you to have a conversation with the individual about what other services they have sought in the past, what has worked, what hasn't worked, so that that case or that clinical justification can be brought back to the managed care organization. If that's just documentation within the record or just referral information, you might see treatment history, but you wouldn't have that individualized piece about what worked for the individual, what didn't work, you know, maybe there was a mismatch somewhere, they didn't, um, couldn't get transportation, some barrier that you'd be able to address. Um, in your interpersonal interaction that wouldn't necessarily be in the paperwork. Um, another question I will let Dave answer. Another question was what training is required for our utilization management specialists or liaison? Uh, whether this is a clinical or non-clinical person, uh, they have to be able to speak the language of utilization management and know what the managed care companies um, might ask, which we're making pretty transparent in these uh, slides and in these presentations. For example, um, know how to identify those data points that the managed care company is going to be interested in. Um, what, what's the evidence of progress that we can get from treatment plans? What's the measurable evidence of progress toward the discharge criteria? What does discharge criteria look like? What objectives are being achieved, et cetera? Um, what is the acuity of, uh, that comes out of the clinical documentation? What is the severity of the symptoms? What necessitates the current level of care? Or if there is a case being made for a higher level of care, what are those points? It's really helpful for the liaison to get into the 
MCO provider manuals because many of them will make very clear what their expectations are for procedures for pre-authorization and ongoing authorization. And it's really important to know that as it applies to whatever um, type of program you're running, whether it's an OASIS outpatient or um, detox services, et cetera. What do the MCO manuals say about that level of care that um, the medical conditions need to, uh, need to reach the thresholds of to be able to be authorized? So all of these points need to be known by the person within the organization that's speaking with the MCOs. They need to know where to, to find them in the documentation and to be able to answer these questions in an informed way. Um, the final question that we received uh, in the past couple of weeks is referring to our approaches that we're presenting. So is the approach that we proposed to the case conceptualization, that 5 P framework, and also um, the acronyms and the treatment uh, planning structure that we proposed, are those what is suggested by the MCOs? And the answer is no. Um, there is no specific structure or process that's requested or suggested by the managed care companies. However, um, what we did in preparing those webinars and that content was we had several conversations um, with a couple of representatives from managed care organizations about what it is they're looking for, and then we looked through the um, literature and found effective clinical practices that sort of match onto that so that if you were to use either of these uh, processes or both of these processes, you would be set up to successfully communicate with the managed care organization the pieces of information that they're looking for. So these are not required, they are not suggested, they are what we suggest um, as potential tools to help you provide the most uh, complete information to the managed care organization. Again, any additional questions, please send over in the chat box and we'd be happy to respond to them today. So getting into uh, the review of our case conceptualization uh, content before we jump over into the case example. Again, case conceptualization is the process where the therapist and the client work collaboratively to first describe and then explain issues the client presents using theory. whose primary function is to guide treatment in order to relieve client distress and build client resilience. So I keep that quote up there and I read it for you because I think it's important to keep in mind um, that idea that case conceptualization is very client specific. There's the client word is in there um, a, a lot to think about. It's about what the client brings, what the client is stressed about, what the client's resilience needs to be. And it also pulls those data pieces together in theory to figure out what's the most uh, evidence-based approach to help this person to guide treatment um, based on what the person's bringing in and what they need. The framework that we reviewed in the case conceptualization webinar that we're going to use again today as a, a background is to look at the five Ps. Again, this is just uh, a tool that we found that get that some of the key pieces of information. The references there below are available if you want to follow up with more information on these. But the five Ps are the presenting problems. So that's where we look at basic demographics, identify the specific needs, presenting problems, things like that. Predisposing factors refer to what could be causing some of these issues, what historically has happened for this person, history of not only the problems, but also treatment history, and any other factors that might have contributed biological, environmental, psychological, interpersonal, um, that could be contributing to the current symptoms and functioning. There's also precipitating factors. That's sort of immediately before. What are the immediate precursors? What's the context around these presenting concerns that might be maintaining, exacerbating, or could alleviate some of these problems or symptoms? What are the perpetuating factors? What's maintaining, again, what's maintaining these symptoms? What could potentially be um, posing a challenge in the future for these, for reduction of these symptoms? Those could be behavioral patterns, biological patterns, um, cognitive factors, interpersonal stressors. And finally, it's important to consider protective and positive factors. What are the strengths or natural supports that the individual has in place um, that could be used to, leveraged to reduce symptoms and improve functioning for the individual. So that's the basic um, review of case conceptualization. And now I believe we're uh, going to pass it over to my colleague at CASA to show you a case example. 
Thank you so much, Brian and Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alam. I'm going to be walking you guys through a specific case uh, with an individual who has substance use history, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how the concept of uh, case conceptualization and treatment planning can be applied to this specific example. I just wanna reiterate um, what Brian uh, mentioned earlier. If you guys have any questions whatsoever, you can always feel free to chat them into the box here, and we will do our us to get you the most um, up-to-date and concise answers. Um, and if not, um, I'll be sharing with you towards the end of this presentation um, an email address that you can send your questions to McTac, and we could hopefully be able to get back to you in a timely fashion with regards to any answers that we may have. Okay, so without any further ado, um, we're gonna be talking today about Miss Amy Cook, who is a 28-year-old divorced African-American female she is self-referred for substance use treatment services. Uh, she has identified her primary problem as alcohol use. She reported upon her intake um, an assessment that she uh, uses six beers uh, daily, along with regular cocaine use um, on a weekly basis, disclosing that she uses anywhere from two to three times a week, up to $30 worth at a time. Her alcohol use has uh, persisted for 18 years now, and her cocaine use started approximately 12 years ago and has been continual since then. Initially, she described her cocaine and alcohol use as being recreational. However, uh, Amy's use quickly became a lot more serious and problematic with her uh, turning to daily use by the time she was 20 years old. Uh, Amy explained that her tolerance had quickly increased, and before she realized it, she needed more of the substance to get the same effect. She had not experienced any serious side effects or medical complications. When asked about medical issues, she denied having any sort of serious uh, issues such as blackouts, tremors, seizures, or DTs. Uh, Amy then reported that she had at one point been, been to a doctor and was told that she has hypertension, uh, but doesn't experience any significant difficulties or effects to uh, her day-to-day -day life and therefore does not take any medication to stabilize this. Okay, moving on to the next slide, um, is specifically talking about psychological functioning. Uh, now, as Brandon mentioned, it's important to gather as much information about the individual as possible for the sake of putting together a case conceptualization uh, content and be able to have solid information to present to the MCOs and incorporate into treatment planning with the client. So uh, as far as her psychological functioning goes, at the time of her intake, uh, Amy was cooperative, alert, oriented, speech was normal, uh, appropriately dressed, and appeared um, uh, intact in, in those mannerisms, and uh, Amy was asked about her current and past psychological functioning and completely denied any sort of um, emotional or psychological problems that were specifically unrelated to her drug use in the last 30 days. Uh, and overall, may I mention. So when asked about her general psychological functioning, she denied having any kind of hallucinations, delusions, uh, currently or in the past. Uh, she also denied having any difficulty with her thought process at this time, but did report that in the past she did have difficulty concentrating on times and had had racing thoughts. Um, Amy denied having any thoughts of suicide or homicide at this time or in the past 30 days and reported that she had never attempted suicide at any point in her life. Amy presented with a full range of affect and showed moderate insight. Amy's self-concept was appropriate, her memory was good, and her judgment did not appear to be impaired at the time of the intake. She later decided to uh, disclose specifics about her educational, vocational, and financial circumstances, starting off with uh, letting us know that she completed uh, all but one year of high school and received specialized training as a welder. Her most recent job was as a parking uh, attendant, her longest period of continuous employment was just over one year, and she has worked irregularly throughout her adult life. Amy reported her current financial support comes mainly from her grandmother and from her employment. Now, Amy disclosed that she does have a significant legal history, um, so she reported involvement currently with probation. Uh, in addition to that, she has had previous offenses of driving without a license, a history of three DUIs, 
possession charges, and prostitution. She's currently on probation specifically for shoplifting, writing of bad checks, and probation violations, all which she describes are in direct relation to her, um, her issue with her addiction with, to alcohol and cocaine. Now, delving a little bit deeper um, th throughout the assessment, she did discuss uh, her social history, uh, currently living with her grandmother, who pretty much has raised her throughout her life. Um, she is a mother of four children. Uh, she was just 17 years old when she had her first child. Uh, her children are age 2, 4, 7, and 11. And uh, currently she's not living with, either of her, with any of her children. The two older sons are living in foster care, and the younger two have complex health problems and developmental delays, and therefore they're living with another relative since she's unable to, to care for them at this time. She's no longer in contact with any of her children's fathers, uh, which totaled to be three men, and was only briefly married to the second man. She reported that both of her parents, several uncles and aunts, and both of her siblings have all had significant drinking or drug use problems. So this isn't anything new to Amy. She's, she disclosed that alcohol has been a part of her upbringing um, and promoted by several family members from a really young age. The onset of her use was at age 10. Um, it's, it's, it was ingrained regularly into her, uh, her upbringing. Um, she disclosed that she does not have any close friends and a distant, conflicted relationship with several family members, um, with exception to her grandmother, with whom she's lived with pretty much her whole life. Um, she did describe that she had great difficulty getting along with, with people in general, and um, which alluded to her lack of support. Uh, she was physically abused as a child, um, which prompted her to, to move in with her grandmother. Amy described her alcohol as part of uh, her family experience, as we mentioned, and uh, a lot of her earliest memories contain uh, drug and alcohol use. Amy shared that she did not feel that she had any problems socially, emotionally, or psychologically until she was in her late teens. Amy reported that she began to spend more time with individuals that used illicit substances and began to get herself into trouble specifically with shoplifting, prostitution, which eventually um, spiraled into the reason why uh, she needed to do it in order to support her, her drug use. Physical history. At the time of her intake, Amy reported that she had never been hospitalized for any major medical problems. She reported hypertension as a chronic medical problem, but denied that it interfered with her life. Now, specific to Amy's treatment history, this doesn't look like it's Amy's first time attempting uh, drug treatment. It, she disclosed that she's had four previous occasions, two of these being uh, detoxification specifically for her alcohol use. Um, although she did, she did go through the process of detox, she had noticed a pattern that every time she would leave her detox and be set up with, with a, let's say, an intensive outpatient or a residential program, she disclosed that um, she found herself leaving the treatment within a few days after detoxification. Um, and this had happened on uh, the two occasions that she did leave detox and other occasions where she attempted um, the program uh, without uh, prior being detoxed. Um, Amy did report sporadic participation in 12-step uh, meetings, such as AA and NA. She also reported that her longest period of abstinence had been for 60 days. So uh, throughout her time trying to remain sober and, and active in her recovery, she did have the tools and, and some coping mechanisms to get herself through 60 days of, of abstinence. Amy then finished up by explaining that she had um, currently been substance-free for approximately four weeks. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about effective and measurable treatment plans, uh, specifically ensuring that the treatment targets are functional, um, uh, I'm sorry, treatment targets the functional deficits to reduce or eliminate the impact of the diagnosis, which is established in the treatment plan. Um, the documentation that needs to, to be included, um, the treatment has to be ordered by a, or prescribed by an appropriate individual. So the specific credentials um, and criteria for someone to be able to diagnose and uh, provide the treatment. The service should be generally accepted um, 
as effective for the mental illness or addiction being treated. So in essence, the level of care needs to be appropriate for the symptomology that the, that the client is presenting with. Also for their previous history, taking that into consideration and, um, and other uh, related factors. The individual, of course, must be willing to participate in treatment. Uh, the individual must be able to benefit from the services provided, and they are in the right level of care. So we're going to talk a little bit later about how does one determine that this, in fact, is the appropriate level of care. Um, the importance of using evidence-based uh, tools, such as we're going to we're going to briefly talk about the locator for substance use programs, um, is is definitely recommended in this case and um, recommended by the MCO and the state um, as as the tool um, for to, to justify level of care. Okay. So the treatment plan objectives, promoting behavioral change between sessions. So it's one thing to, to state that so-and-so will be doing A, B, and C, but the importance of the behavioral change between these sessions is really what needs to be highlighted here and um, be able to produce in order to, to justify that this level of care is working, that these treatment objectives are, are targeted and measurable. Um, a well-written objective uh, drives effective treatment planning. Uh, follow a specific formula. These two recommended formulas um, are, are listed here, one being that, it's, that the objective is simple, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-limited, also known as SMART, and the second one known as Roomba, realistic, understandable, measurable, behavioral, and achievable. Both very similar. They are recommendations to use as guidelines versus anything else. It's, it's, it could be helpful to have this laid out as, um, as a clinician is, is working with an individual to, to make sure that these, these uh, specific formulas are being measured. And finally, objectives should be written with the client and crossed off the list when achieved. So just circling back to the whole concept of, of this change in, in healthcare reform, ensuring that this process is a person-centered process. Um, it actually falls right in line with, with what the MCOs are looking for as far as ensuring that we're providing value-based treatment, ensuring that the client is involved in every step of, the, of, the, of their treatment in order to promote better, uh, better outcomes. Um, and by doing this and, and actively checking in on the client and their goals and, and are they working towards them um, is definitely something that's recommended throughout the way and, and also encouraging and, and uh, motivating the client to remain engaged. Okay, so some of the objectives that we've identified specific to Amy's case here um, are, listed, are listed here on this slide. Um, Amy will work towards her sobriety and recovery, and within the next 90 days, will find sponsorship through a 12-step group. Now, this is pretty, pretty solid. Now you have structured timeline, you have the, the specific goal or objective uh, that is to be achieved. Uh, it gives the client very clear, concise instructions in order to help them gain, gain the sobriety and recovery that, that, that she's looking for in this specific case. Um, objective number two, uh, within the next four to six weeks, Amy will call her grandmother and brother and ask them to attend a family therapy session. Incorporating the family is a very, very integral part of treatment. Um, it seems like Amy has a great support from her grandmother. She's been the consistent figure in her life since she was younger. Um, she does mention that she has strained relationships with her siblings, with other family members, um, but she did mention that one of her brothers happens to be in and out of the picture, and she considers him a possible support for her in the future. So it's important to, to highlight these um, these important uh, contenders here and, and incorporate them into the treatment um, as a form of, of treating the, the addiction as a, on a family unit um, and also addressing Amy's particular issues that could be in relation to grandmother or brother and exemplifying what uh, strengthening interpersonal relationships look like. The next objective, uh, for the next three months, Amy will report on her weekly attendance to her 12-step meetings. 
holding the client accountable, giving them clear and concise instructions, and, and helping them through the way on how to sort this out. For the next three months, she's going to bring in uh, to her weekly sessions with the, with the counselor all the 12-step meetings that she has attended. That way it gives, it gives a, a touch point for, for the counselor to check in with the client and see how effective these meetings are and, um, and talk openly with, uh, with Amy about her progress. Within the next four weeks, Amy will bring to session her job application log and attendance to Employment Service Agency. One of the things Amy mentioned that she's interested in doing is perhaps changing her, her, uh, her employment. A lot of her financial needs are still not met and therefore she's relying a lot on grandmother and her employment in order to uh, make ends meet which from the context we heard before, we know that the financial struggle could be a possible trigger for her, um, for her use. Uh, in addition to that, ensuring that uh, she is regularly being active about attending uh, these employment service, um, service appointments that uh, she agreed upon during the treatment plan uh, process. Um, she had stated that she will uh, that she will um, actively be looking for a job, also because of the concerns of her legal uh, history. She did disclose that she has multiple DUIs, and um, she has, in fact, been convicted of driving without a license, and therefore her job as, a, uh, as an attendant moving cars um, is probably not a long-term job for her. Um, she did she did state that there were no, there were no uh, background checks or anything like that, hence the reason why she's able to keep this job um, for as long as she has, but she's trying to be proactive and look for an alternate option. So she's not stuck in a position where finances are, um, are uh, a larger issue for her. Amy will coordinate with uh, probation officer for an in-person check-in by week six in order to meet with the counselor and Amy to discuss her progress. Looping in any collaterals within, within the case, her probation officer, obviously her legal manner, matters are on the forefront here. Um, in order to address this and ensuring that both parties touch base, the counselor, the probation officer, in order to ensure that uh, it's a comprehensive treatment package for Amy. Um, and holding her accountable to her responsibilities, which is an important piece to treating um, addiction and, and achieving sobriety and, and life in recovery. Treatment planning for this specific case example. Again, we're going to use one of the two recommended, uh, recommended measurables here. So simple, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time limited. We want to base all of our objectives and our goals and make sure that they line up uh, with, uh, with that. So the goals, objectives, of in and interventions are showed below, uh, and they're identified, obviously, in collaboration with the client. Again, ensuring that the client is involved in every step of the way, making sure that they own this treatment plan, making sure that they own the process, um, buying into what it is that they're going to be doing with their life for the next weeks, next few months. Um, so the first identified goal is working towards sobriety and recovery. And the objective is within the next 90 days, <clears throat> within the next 90 days, Amy will get the support of a sponsor through her local NA and AA group. Now this lines up, she had said that she was going to be attending regularly, uh, weekly, and uh, in hopes to be able to, to strengthen her social supports in the recovery network. The intervention there would be attend regular individual and group sessions, provide urine drug screen samples as requested. Obtain better employment so that she could become financially self-sufficient and not rely on grandmother. As she mentioned, you, her financial stressors are something that have contributed to her use in the past, and therefore it's something that she has on the forefront. The objective there is before the end of the year, Amy will identify areas of interest and a list of potential employers along with exploring available employment and vocational services. So the counselor provides Amy with the support and some information, perhaps listing a few programs that are within the client's immediate community um, to make her way over and, and uh, actually start to put this objective and this goal into place, into action. And the intervention there would be to meet with the vocational specialist at the local one-stop employment center taking solid steps moving forward. And that's exactly what we want to motivate the, the individual to do by giving them clear and concise instruction on how to do so. 
uh, addressing the chronic medical condition of hypertension. Now, she mentioned earlier, she really had no motivation to, to take care of her hypertension. She may have stumbled into a clinic at one point in her life, a medical clinic, and they told her she had hypertension. She didn't notice any significant change in her, in her health or in her behaviors, or, and it didn't affect her day to day, but coming to groups, coming to speak with a counselor has brought up the, the uh, potential dangers of having hypertension that's untreated, especially with her alcohol use um, and cocaine use. So in order to loop in and, and, again, make this process very collaborative and inclusive of all the person's entire um, health and well-being, that is definitely a goal that um, that is, uh, is definitely on the forefront. So the objective being there, finding a doctor that will help develop a course of treatment that can help her manage her hypertension with the intervention of utilizing referral services offered by the managed care organization as needed. So using the in-network uh, services provided through her, uh, through her MCO. And finally, addressing legal obligations to probation. As we mentioned, it's a whole package. So in order for her legal matters to not serve as a trigger or, or continuously be something that stands in the way of her recovery and sobriety, it's important to loop it into the treatment plan. So the objective there is throughout the time Amy is on probation, she will remain in good standing. And the intervention specific to that would be to provide urine samples as requested, attend schedule appointments with the probation officer, and in addition to that, attend all the group and individual sessions scheduled. Okay, now uh, incorporating the, the five Ps framework in relation to this specific case, um, we're going to loop it all in, pull it all together. So the specific diagnosis that we've gathered through the intake and assessment process with Amy happens to be alcohol use disorder severe uh, and cocaine use disorder severe. Now we've just a brief plug for the new DSM-5. This is this has changed significantly from the previous years where we've used the DSM-4 diagnosis. Now we're working with a different wording um, of our diagnoses along with a scale now. We're either measure, measuring severe, moderate, mild symptoms, and and that is how we're notating the diagnosis. So it's specific, uh, specifically important uh, to know that um, in order to communicate with our MCOs, because assuming that's, that's the language that they're going to be using, so ensuring that all counselors are in tune um, and provide, provide a training on the new terminology as far as diagnoses go with the DSM-5. The presenting problems excessive use of substances, impeding on daily functioning, her lack of social supports, untreated chronic medical condition, and legal issues. So uh, when we're talking about the presenting problems, it's important for us to be able to gather important baseline information. Um, and the purpose of that is to ensure that we have a baseline to, to measure progress from. And presenting this to the MCO, being able to say, Amy was, uh, when she first started with us, here's where, she, here's where she was, here's where she stood with her goals, and here's the progress we've made thus far. Again, emphasizing the ability to have measurable outcomes. Predisposing factors, um, some of those happen to be family history of, of SUD. Um, she mentioned that uh, a good amount of her family members uh, suffered with substance use in the past and that it was actually integrated into her day-to-day -day growing up. Um, her parents, her siblings, uh, that, that obviously has, plays a big role as far as um, genetic disposition. Uh, legal issues, uh, she has a laundry list of things that were going on and she's even currently on probation. Interpersonal relationship strains, she blatantly says, I don't get along well with most people. Um, the majority of her family seems to be, uh, seems to be strange. She doesn't necessarily have any close relationships with, with many people besides her grandmother and, and potentially a brother. Uh, the financial strain of not having a job that's able to provide enough for her in order to maintain her day-to-day. -day. Um, the medical condition potentially perpetuated by her SUD. Uh, the high blood pressure potentially it goes unchecked, but more than likely the alcohol use is playing a part there, especially because it's consistent, it's daily. Um, her high-risk use. Um, that in itself is obviously very concerning. Um, that's, she's using daily, she's using cocaine and alcohol, which as we know is, is uh, 
uh, is something that, um, that is very concerning for an individual, especially when it's daily use. She has a history of treatment dropout. So she's attempted. There's a level of motivation there. There's a level of self-awareness that she has an issue of some kind. She's not quite sure how to deal with it, but she's enrolled herself in multiple programs in the past, just has not been able to, to engage enough to continue on. Um, and her risk-taking behaviors, as mentioned before. She does mention a history of prostitution, um, denies that it's happening now, but there's that. We're possibly associating some sort of trauma that came with that as well. Um, so ensuring that we're, we're identifying and addressing all of, these, all of these issues and bringing them to the light. Okay. Precipitating factors. Um, untreated medical condition, uh, potentially perpetuating, uh, perpetuated by the SUD, high-risk use, interpersonal, legal, and financial stressors all loop into her current situation and fall under precipitating factors. Um, and again, highlighting the trauma related to her current functioning perhaps. Um, you know, sometimes trauma isn't brought to the light in, in, in such a structured manner. It could be stress in relation to, to what she's going through. Um, so we can loosely define trauma there um, and, and consider that under per, uh, precipitating factors. Perpetuating factors, a uh, limited support network. She states that grandmother happens to really be the only one that's there consistently. Strained interpersonal relationships, medical condition, low self-esteem, a history of trauma, and continuous use. Um, again, with the uh, protective and positive factors, this actually is, is one that is very important in order to, to highlight and, and bring to the light um, the strengths and the supports which mitigate the, the impact of the presenting problems. We want to make sure that we talk about what she's been able to achieve in the past. She's had a history of sobriety. She claims that she's been able to stay clean for at least two months, 60 days. She does have a history of 12-step involvement. She's been to several AA and NA meetings in an attempt to, uh, to work towards her sobriety. And she has some family support. She states that she has a safe living situation. It's, it's consistent. She has a roof over her head and strong desire to change her life. Some additional considerations to take. So as part of the initial substance use evaluation process, the treating program completed the locator with the client. Now the locator is the evidence-based tool that's supposed to be used in order to determine the appropriate level of care for an individual. Um, and the level of care determination for this specific client, Amy, um, was for outpatient rehabilitation services. She did state that she was at that point four weeks clean and um, but still was troubled with, with a lot of the um, circumstances she had going on and, and was perhaps afraid uh, of potential relapse. Um, outpatient treatment, uh, our Article 822 clinics, uh, just a brief overview and some of the admission guidelines. So um, the clinics typically for people who have lower relapse potential and higher uh, recovery capital, uh, for example, individual strengths, uh, that support recovery, such as housing, family, or a job, which in Amy's case, she fortunately, she has all three currently. Um, abstinence based on drug treatment program for people who live at home or in the community. Uh, the clinic includes intensive outpatient services. All admissions to IOS should be reported to the plan. Most programs will use the locator tool to actually report, the actual report to notify the MCOs. Now, just to clarify, um, outpatient does not require pre-authorization, but for an intensive outpatient service, it's important to continuously keep in touch with the MCO and notify them of who's in your program and what, uh, what, the, uh, what the outcome of the locator report was. Uh, programs are required to complete the locator, as mentioned, for all admissions, and this specifically must happen within three visits. Uh, plans may require calls, reports, or other routine requests for authorizations for clinic admissions. Um, there's always that possibility. It's important to have this information there available in the event that the MCOs did reach out. Uh, programs may, uh, may be reviewed by plans for clinic admission standards if the practice triggers an approved admission review target. 
And what that means is that if there's an outlier of some sort, let's say the person has been attending your program, they've attended uh, 60 plus groups or 60 plus hours of treatment and still happen to be in, in the program, they want to talk about, okay, well, where does this person stand? Maybe in comparison to other outpatient programs, you happen to be putting in a lot of hours towards your clientele or maybe too little. So these sorts of, uh, of um, scenarios can, can uh, bring attention and, and, be, and be categorized as an outlier. Now, that's just a very loose example. Now, I'm sure that um, as time goes on, uh, you and the MCO will, will figure this out together. As mentioned, this is a very new process, so we're all kind of figuring out what these defined outliers will be in time. Now, some questions that the MCO may ask, um, just to have information prepared uh, and ready to go in the event that they do pose these questions. Um, it's my understanding that these questions are actually straight from the horse's mouth. These are actually questions that the MCO did put forth, um, and uh, we wanted to make sure to, to give that information to you so that way you're, you're aware of where the thought processes are. So how will the treatment impact Amy's individualized psychosocial needs? Why is this treatment necessary? What else has been tried and why hasn't it been sufficient? And would she be successful in a lower level of care? Why or why not? So how will the treatment impact Amy's individual psychosocial needs? We want to be able to defend that and say, hey, this is why we think that she's appropriate for outpatient. This is what our treatment plan is going to target and this is how it's going to help her. Um, so being as specific and targeted as possible. And the previous um, webinar to this, Dave actually mentioned the use of quotations, uh, being able to, to put the client's words, embed that into their treatment plan and ensure that they're very much a part of the process. Um, why is the treatment necessary? You want to be able to, to talk about previous experiences, failed, failed attempts at other, pre, uh, other uh, levels of care that perhaps were lower, um, all things that are, that are considered in this process. What else has been tried and why hasn't it been sufficient? Again, talking about her previous experiences, talking about her ability to stay clean for 60 days but not believing that she doesn't have the tools to, to continue further past that and hence her, her self-referral to treatment. So you want to be as specific as possible and gather this information through the assessment and intake process with the client. Um, what will be accomplished by this treatment? How does this treatment fit into the bigger picture of Amy's recovery? We want to talk about her overall goals at the end of the day. What does she want to achieve and how does being in an, in an intensive outpatient help her with this? Uh, giving her more structure, perhaps, giving her the proper tools to deal with, with uh, life once she is back in the community, uh, how to advocate for herself, how to, how to reach out and find out what resources are available to her, such as the employment agency, such as the local uh, medical clinic that she can go and, and consult with the doctor and get her, uh, her hypertension uh, under control. How will you know when a treatment goal has been achieved? What are you looking for and how will you monitor it? It's, it's, there's a high emphasis put on the continuous monitoring of these goals, ensuring that you're going back you know, every so often and, and crossing, out the, crossing off the things that have already been achieved. If Amy has, has looked into a job, has listed her, her possible employers, has gone on an interview and achieved that employment, you know what, we're crossing that off. And it's, it, it provides motivation, it provides continuous uh, movement forward for the clients uh, to see that they're actually accomplishing some of these goals that they set out. And being able to, to describe that to the NCO. Um, move on, there's another slide here also with some additional questions uh, that the MCO may ask you. What strengths and support does she have uh, that will facilitate discharge and transition to a lower level of care and recovery? Now, specific to Amy's case, we talked about her grandmother being a, um, a support for her. How will she play into, into the, the possibility of discharge later down the line? Well, she has solid housing. She has uh, somewhat of a support system with her. She uh, is currently working and grandmother is willing to help her um, as she finds new employment, so on and so forth. Being able to walk through uh, how eventually this is going to be beneficial for the client by, by getting through this level of care. Where is the evidence that recovery goals are member-driven? 
again, uh, Dave's example of using quotations, making sure that you put the client's words right in the treatment plan, um, have them own it that much more by, by uh, quoting their specific needs and wants in, within the plan itself. Is Amy willing to participate in rehabilitation activities? How are you showing that? Is she being active? Is she attending? Is she not missing her groups? Is she uh, taking her urine drug screens as scheduled? Um, all of those things uh, could potentially serve as, as examples of her willingness to participate. What is the proposed time period for the treatment plan? Clinical justification with measurable goals and objectives. You want to be able to put specific timelines on each and every goal. What, how long is it going to take for her to initiate a conversation with regards to sponsorship at her 12-step meetings? So being very concrete. Are there anticipated barriers uh, to treatment success? And what is in place to address these barriers? So being able to identify potential crises or, or issues that could, that could uh, delineate the process and being able to plan for them and how you will do so, incorporating that kind of backup plan into the treatment plan. Okay. So I want to say that we're wrapping up here. So I wanted to definitely encourage anybody that has any questions for Brian and David or I, please feel free to chat them into the box. If for whatever reason, after the, after the webinar, you think of something that could pertain to, to this topic that we've talked about today, and you feel the need to, to shoot over a question to the MCTAC uh, email, it's actually listed on this slide. It's on the bottom there, it's MC. TAC.info at NYU.edu. Um, this mailbox is checked regularly, so we definitely encourage you guys to send over any questions, concerns, comments you may have, and we will do our best to get back to you within a timely fashion to address anything that, uh, that you still may have questions about. Uh, I also want to encourage you to visit the MCTAC website. There's so many tools uh, there to use. There's a glossary for commonly used um, acronyms. I know in this new world of of healthcare reform, there's so many being thrown around. It's very helpful. Um, in addition to that, if you go to the events link, you'll be able to see what sort of uh, trainings we have coming up, be able to register and sign up for these trainings. Uh, so please feel free to do so. And again, that website is mctac.org, mctac.org. And thank you so much. Brianna, I don't know if you have anything to add. I, uh, I think that we have a poll question that we'd like to ask just before people get off. Um, at MixHack, we're always interested in feedback to make sure that um, what we're providing is very helpful. Um, so on the right-hand side of your screen right now, you'll see our poll question. We're interested in knowing if the format of this applied learning discussion, the reviewing a case example, uh, was helpful to you. So if you could please take a minute to, to fill that out so that we can see uh, whether this is a format that we should continue for the next two ALDs that are coming up. Um, and while I have the microphone, I do want to say um, we're taking a little break um, from our webinar series for the holiday for Thanksgiving, but our next webinar in this series is going to be covering clinical supervision uh, in this world of utilization management, and that is going to be on December 1st at 12 o'clock, um, so we encourage you to attend that as well. Um, and then I do think that we have a question, Alam, if you're still um, able to respond. Um, so, the question is that uh, many clients are legally mandated and not internally motivated for treatment, so what types of objectives would satisfy the MCOs for this situation? That is a good question. I, I mean, you want to definitely list out their, their motivation is, in fact, to comply with their legal mandate, um, and that, in fact, is for several reasons, a motivator. Um, understandably so, a lot of times we have clients that are there because their probation officer said so. Um, so, you know, trying to kind of work with the client to figure out, okay, well, what led you to where you were um, as far as what led you to, to this uh, state with your legal issue? You know, how can we uh, avoid that? How can we work on the issues, the precipitating factors that brought you to that place? Um, so I'm not sure if I have a very clear and concise answer for you, but I do believe that it's important to just work with the client and find out, yeah, your probation officer sent you here, but what got you to where, to where you are today in the first place? And let's try to focus in on that. I think also, Alam, that's a good question that we will definitely take back to our managed care 
uh, company contacts and Absolutely. find out if they have any more specific guidance for that and certainly share that um, as we go through the, the rest of the webinar series also. Absolutely. Okay, well, I do want to also say that these slides will be posted onto the MCTAC website under the Learning Communities tab, so please feel free to share them with others in your organization who aren't able to attend. Um, we're hoping these are a training resource um, for folks moving forward, so um, hopefully they are helpful to you. Please don't hesitate, as Alam said, to send us questions or comments. We're always hoping to improve, um, so we look forward to that feedback. Um, and that's all from my end, Alam. Thanks so much, Brian. and same here. Everybody have a great afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you at our future events. Take care.